Hello, I'm Linda Hayes, the Managing Director of Corporate Synergies Australia. CSA has been working with National Disability Services Queensland since 2012, assisting with the strengthening workforce capacity in the areas of governance, strategy, risk, viability and sustainability. Through this relationship, we were invited to participate in the Sector Readiness and Workforce Capacity Initiative and support the Organisational Development Toolkit by providing some tactical strategies and tools around costing, pricing and budgeting as part of your viability and sustainability. It's a big topic and very important for any organisation moving towards individual care packages, user pays programs and social enterprise strategies. So we will be looking at it through four key sessions. What costs do we need to consider under the unit costing principles? How do we apportion our overheads to individual programs? How does cost relate to price in the not-for-profit environment? And how can we apply this to our budgeting and forecasting? The workbook, PowerPoint and tools used are all available online. Welcome to session one, cost. We tend to think of cost as those resources we have to pay for to deliver our service. Wages, equipment, consumables. But that's only part of the story. The true cost of a program or the service is the total value every resource used, whether we pay for it or not. The Productivity Commission report on the contribution to the NFP sector developed a model that recognises that we are unique in regards to the inputs and resources and that they are not always financial in origin. If you now refer to and have a look at slide 5, we're going to have a look at that model. The model shows that we range between inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes and impacts. In most of the situations we will face, our government funding allows for inputs for us to do activities and report back on the outputs. That is a traditional funding model that we have gone through over the past 10 to 15 years. What the Productivity Commission report suggests, however, is that we now need to start to have a look at outcomes and our impacts. And if we look at the last two sections of this model, we've got the outcomes as being the benefits for the participants during and after the organisational activity. And in the longer term, what the impacts are, not only for our organisation, for the individual client, but also for the community as our whole. This is starting to be very important when we start to consider our cost of service delivery. In the past, we have equated our cost of service delivery with those resources we needed to achieve our outputs. But in the future, we actually need to start thinking about the costs to achieve our outcomes and our impacts and most importantly recognise that this is not often contributed by the government sector. So let's have a look at inputs and think about inputs from a daily activity point of view. Now this can be our money, our staff, our staff time, volunteers and our volunteer time, so an unpaid resource which is very important for us to consider in the bigger cost matrix our facilities and those direct equipment and consumables that we need to deliver a task. So for example, if we are doing a home care visit, it may be a vehicle to get us to and from the location. In regards to the type of activities, if we look at the not-for-profit sector as a whole, there is a vast range of activities that we all perform and services that we all deliver for our clients be they formal services or more informal services that we give as a value add to our clients. If we look at the activities that are included within the Productivity Commission report, it is things such as feed and shelter homeless, provide job training, education, counselling and the range of different activities around that, creating mentorship and relationships within community sectors, conserving historical heritage in places and also organising community events. Within those activities we have out immediate outputs. They are the service hours or the immediate transaction that our client receives from us actually employing the service or activity in the first place. 
So these are the direct products of the organisation's activities. So for example, it could be the number of service hours delivered, the number of visits that we have to our clients, the number of hours we spend with our clients, the number of nights and stays that they may have at our house. It could be a number of educational materials that we distributed within any point in time. We are very used to the output centric modelling and we often have to do all of our reporting based on the outputs with which we deliver. The limitation that we all have in regards to outputs is the fact that we tend to use or look at outputs as the total amount of cost for which we can contribute to a program. But this is not necessarily true. And as we move further across the model, we now start looking at outcomes and impacts. When we think about outcomes and impacts, it's very important to start thinking about the terms that government agencies are now using to us, such as co-contribution and social value, and putting some finite measurements around our social value and our contribution within the community. In this example, the outcomes further benefits um, the participants far beyond the actual activity itself. So for example, if it is a community inclusion activity, the long-term outcomes become those social benefits that our client would have in regards to long-term meeting, interacting and having involvement with other people in the community. It could be the relationships they forge or it could be their better sense of social self. Further to that are the long-term impacts our organisation has had. And if we think about our long-term impacts, it's what would our community be like if we were not here? The bigger the hole we leave by not being within the community, the better our social impact and the better our social value to that community. Thinking about costs in terms of our viability and sustainability, we need to meet our outputs to be viable, but we need to meet our impacts to be sustainable. Our government grants and income support our outputs, yet they are now asking for us to report on outcomes and impacts. We are also starting to hear terms such as co-contribution, social value, understanding that our true costs can help us evidence this. To know our true costs involves detailed identification, categorisation, measurement and valuation of all resource inputs exchanged, not only to achieve our service outputs, but also our longer term outcomes and impacts. To do this, we really need to start looking at categorising costs. And we're going to start by looking at direct and indirect costs through a table on slide 8. The table on slide 8 is a good representation of a standard funding agency and what they would consider as a direct cost for which they are paying for service and the indirect costs with which they would expect our organisations to cover in our own costs. If we look at the first column, we think about two areas of direct costs. The first is the time spent directly with the client or the user, for example, doing the counselling, visiting that person, doing direct case management or assisting them with any type of personal assistance or care. In the second column, they also recognise that there are a certain amount of non-face-to-face -face hours which we need to achieve to still be able to deliver on our direct costs and on our outputs. They are things such as the time spent on behalf of a client, assisting or find doing research in regards to appointment making, arranging referrals, writing file notes, participating in case conferences, recording data, at time of assessment, and this is a very important thing when we look at our indirect costs in the next column, our mobile service delivery, if we are agreed to have a mobile service delivery, and again the fact that this is different from transport or travel to and from our clients, and also the preparation of direct training materials for our staff to manage an individual client. What they don't count as direct hours or output hours in regards to our agreements include things that we need to support the whole structure of the organisation. 
such as team meetings, travel to and from doctor's appointments or other events that are not direct client service, training in regards to general training that we need for compliance and, and mandatory regulations, network meetings that we have with other organisations and our peak bodies, sorry NDS, receiving supervision and receiving that mentorship from our peak bodies to improve our quality controls and systems, compiling or entering data for the purpose of reporting to the government agencies versus what we can charge for, which is the individual case management and reporting on those one individual clients, the collation of general data that we need to evidence our situation, supervising staff, so everybody who's not doing direct service delivery basically there, and general administrative tasks, including our finance managers who need to do the payroll, an essential part of our business, but not necessarily seen as a direct service cost by our funding agencies. If we sit down and think about our direct and indirect costs, that's exactly the start that we need to make to look at our own true cost of doing business. From now on, what we need to do is look at the bigger picture, not only the cost that can be directly attributed to the service delivery, but actually those costs that all contribute and support the organisation's ability to be open to deliver the service in the first place. So now we've had a look at some direct and indirect costs that we may be able to attribute to our program overall. But as well as that, we actually need to consider some other categories of costs as well. Very quickly, we're going to be going over our fixed and variable costs, capital costs, and most importantly, shadow costs. There is a lot more information on these within your workbook and also within the slides. So please go and have a look at those. And after that, we'll be coming together and doing an exercise which incorporates all costs. Costs that say the same, regardless of the number of service hours we delivered, are fixed costs. And they include our key infrastructure costs such as rent, vehicles, training and equipment. On the other hand, variable costs are those that increase as we deliver more, wages, petrol, consumables. Our next lot of costs are capital costs, which are those that are applied for more than 12 months and often firm form our long-term assets. Examples of this would be our property, specialist equipment, technology and IT. Our final type of costs are shadow costs. Shadow costs are the value of those resources that we don't have to pay for. Our single largest shadow cost is volunteer hours. In 2012, the ATO board approved that the value of $24.92 can be allocated to our volunteer hours and appear on our audited accounts. For many organisations, this is significant evidence towards our program co-contribution. So let's look at an exercise, a DIY exercise, in costing a program. If we have a look at slide 13, there is an activity that is community access activity. And I've chosen this activity as one that's common to all of us, regardless of what sector we tend to work in. In this particular organisation, their activity includes weekly community trips to participate in local activities and visit local attractions. The activities mainly include things such as movies, bowling, zoo trips, shopping trips and visits to local parks. The locations are various around Brisbane. So let's start by having a look at the key inputs. Most importantly, the key inputs are those direct costs, those monies we know we have to pay to be able to deliver the service. And our biggest direct cost is always the wages, unless we're one of those lucky organisations that doesn't have any wages at all and we're all volunteer based. So staff wages of course is an indirect cost. And then we go on to transport because we actually do take people from our location to the various um, attractions and locations that we're visiting. So that there is a direct cost for transport which was petrol on the day. We then have entry fees and tickets to the various attractions or places that we're going. We also have medical and mobility equipment that we know from a compliance point of view is essential to have on the bus. 
Another key input is those training that we must have to be able to service the activity properly. So in this case it's going to be some manual handling training to assist people getting on and off buses with and without their equipment and mobility equipment. It also is going to be in regards to behaviour and also it's essential that we have a first aid, a fully trained first aid officer on site. And after that we have our general consumables that will all vary depending on what it is and how long the activity is for the day. For example, we may take water, we may pack lunches or we may be asking our clients to bring it themselves. So in the next column we have direct costs. So our direct costs are all of those costs that can be directly valued against our key inputs. So that's why that column is white and the key input column is blue. So we start our, always start our exercise, direct key inputs, direct costs. We then have to consider all of the other things we have in our organisation and all of the other resources we have in our organisation that made the trip possible. So we're moving into the middle column which is called overheads. What else do we need to do or have to ensure that the activity occurs? So not only do we have our direct staff wages, those wages of the people that are on the bus that day, but we also have the wages of our administrative staff, we have our long service leave, we have our holiday pay, we have our PAYG entitlements. We have vehicle maintenance, we're putting petrol in the car on the day, but then we also have the ongoing vehicle maintenance to ensure that it is compliant to be able to use for transportation of our clients. We have the vehicle insurances and the depreciation that we take off the books every month. We have the time taken to organise the group in the first place, so it's not a direct service hour, but it is the time and all the phone calls in what we're going to do, are, is that compliant, can we take our clients there, do they have all of the access that we may require depending on who our clients are. There is also maintenance of the medical and mobility equipment that we have on the bus. And in regards to training, we have our bigger organisational compliance training in work health and safety, in aged care or disability care, whatever the larger acts and sectors require. So next to our overheads, if we marry those with a true value or a unit value cost, that becomes our list of indirect costs. So the indirect costs are the monetary values we can attribute to overheads. Then the final column is always the tricky one and it's the one that we very, very, very rarely consider and that is shadow costs. Now shadow costs are all of those other resources that in a normal commercial environment or given normal circumstances we as organisations would have to pay for. Our biggest shadow cost as we've already outlined is our volunteer hours. So in this case our transport was actually by, driven by a volunteer driver whom we didn't have to pay. We also receive, are lucky enough to receive a discount from the local mechanic because he believes in supporting community and he is also one of our sponsors so he maintains our fleet of vehicles for only half the price of everyone else. We receive discounts and free tickets during the year. Some of our um, better known and more regular destinations actually provide us with up to 100 tickets each year. And again, that's money that we don't need to pay to be able to deliver our service. We get donated equipment from many different areas in regards to fundraising for specialised mobility equipment that we need. And we also have some of our staff in regards to training come to us already with prerequisite training under their belt. So again, we gain the benefit of that, but we don't necessarily need to pay for it. Attributing cost then, or monetary value to our shadow costs, can actually increase our true cost price if we add all direct, indirect and shadow costs together. And when we do that, we start to understand the true or full cost of delivering our service. So think program, organisation and donations. 
and then this exercise can be easily conducted for all and any programs. Common cost descriptors will start to appear, but values will and should be different. Being able to complete this exercise is the first step in discovering our unit costs, and the next step is to start to apportion our organisational costs to the individual programs. And that's what we're going to start looking at in session two.